Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Derek, and I'm a ceramic specialist, but don't hold it against me. Now, um, in recent years, as, as Shannon just mentioned, um, there has been a lot of work taking place on medieval hunting parks um, in England, uh, some work in Wales. There has been nothing happening uh, in Scotland since John Gilbert's seminal John Donald publication of the late 1970s um, on hunting and hunting reserves in medieval Scotland. In 2010, um, I got a phone call from Richard Oram who said that he had a master's student um, at Stirling University who was doing some work on um, medieval deer parks in Scotland and would I be interested in coming on board um, to undertake the field work um, on behalf of that project? Um, I jumped at it because I, I do tend to have a history um, of dealing with monument types that people haven't really ever looked at, um, whether it be hospitals, granges. Um, I thought deer parks fitted the bill quite nicely for that as well. Um, Kevin Malloy, um, who um, is the gentleman that was doing his masters at Stirling at the time, had chosen three parks in Scotland. Um, the major royal deer park at Kincardine, um, which is beside the Cairnamount Road. Um, Durwood's Dyke in Angus, um, about which not very much was known, um, but it was thought to possibly be baronial, um, belonging to Alan Durwood, um, who was treasurer uh, of Scotland at that period in time. And thirdly, the rather curious monument at Buzzard Dykes, um, which, as you'll see later on, it wasn't until the 1940s that it was reinterpreted um, as a deer park. Now, um, these three monuments, um, as you can see, these are all to scale. They do differ in size quite considerably from the absolutely massive deer park of Kincardine um, down to the smaller ones um, of Durwoods and Buzzet. Buzzet is the smallest um, of the three. What um, is common to them all is there are still upstanding earthworks. So you will still have banks and ditches that are defining these parks. The important thing to remember about a deer park is it will have a substantial bank and it will have a ditch, but the ditch is an internal ditch to prevent the deer from getting out. Um, beyond the upstanding earthworks, um, we have very little um, idea um, of what these boundaries may have originally looked like. Looked like. Occasionally we get clues. Um, this seal of George Douglas, 4th Earl of Angus, um, which dates to the 15th century, um, has what is probably um, a deer park fence or pale shown at the very top um, with upright posts and wattle fencing. So as well as the bank and ditch, you may well have had a, a palisade fence um, along the top. Now, the idea with these three parks was very simple. We would go along to each one and open a trench across the bank and ditch to get some idea of the way that it had been built, to see whether there was any evidence for a palisade line, um, and whether we might be able to get some dating evidence. Um, we started uh, at King Cardin, the big royal deer park, which you will note the reason we started there is because it's beside this fantastic cafe um, at Clattering Brig. Highly, re highly recommended to anybody. Um, Kevin hadn't done much digging, but he was quite impressed after this. I thought he thought this archaeology game is quite good. Um, at King Cardin, we chose a section um, of Park Pale um, that was actually quite badly damaged already. So our trench was going into a section um, where some damage had already been done. We, we thought it was, was better to do it that way. We cut our section through the bank and the ditch. The first thing we discover is the ditch is virtually no deeper than what you can actually see in the landscape. It's only about maybe 10 or 15 centimeters deep. The bank um, is only about 60 or 70 centimeters high. But this particular section has a stone core to it. Um, that, that's quite significant, I think, because 
other parts of this park have absolutely enormous banks and ditches, um, which I think probably don't have any stone in them at all. The ditch is very deep, and they're throwing the soil up um, to create the bank. Um, next, we went to Buzzard Dykes. Um, earlier, I said about the reinterpretation of this monument. This is fantastic. If you look at the Ordnance Survey name book for this site, this is the site of Mons Graupius. This was the Caledonian camp where all the natives fought off the Romans. Um, they neglected to notice that the ditch was on the wrong side um, of the bank. And it wasn't until um, work by OGS Crawford um, uh, in the 1940s that he said, look, this is probably a deer park. Um, it would work a lot better um, as that sort of interpretation. Buzzard Dykes is quite a late name. It's probably 18th, 19th century. Um, it's very striking if you're working up there, the amount of buzzards that are still circling over the monument. That means we don't know what its original name was, um, which does cause a problem when it comes to some documentary research. Again, um, we chose um, a section of bank and ditch which looked like it had already had a, a gap driven through it. We thought it would be easier, again, to look at a piece that we thought had been already damaged. As it transpired, where we put our trench was actually a genuine terminal end to that piece of the bank and ditch. Um, now, I've cheated here because, I mean, that's our trench on the right-hand side, which has this very distinctive um, angular stone-built base to that terminal end of the bank. I wonder, if you look at the other terminal end, which is just a few meters away, if you replicate that, I think we might have a genuine entrance coming into this park, which almost has a stone funnel, um, which if you're driving deer into a park, probably from the forest of Clooney, which is out that way anyway, then that would make a lot more sense to me um, as, as a way of accessing the park. Um, the ditch, um, it still is pretty deep in the landscape. It's about a metre 20 deep. Um, we got about another 40 uh, or 50 centimetres to the base. We also got um, an original ground surface preserved under that bank. Um, Soil samples were being taken as, as part of this project. Um, they've been analysed, and unfortunately, um, preservation um, of organic remains is not very good, so, so they haven't really been able to tell us very much, which is unfortunate. Um, this is what we ended up with at Buzzet. Um, it looks like we've got a two-phase ditch, and there's a recut in it. The stone base runs right the way across the bank. Um, at that moment in time, we began to wonder, does the whole of the western boundary of this park have a stone base? I mean, this runs for two, two kilometers across the landscape. Um, and I had this marvelous image of a medieval manpower services scheme. Um, more of that later. Um, the third site, Durwood's Dyke, um, located on top of the knock of Formal, um, which meant going to site every morning was highly entertaining because we had to carry all our tools. Um, right the way to the top um, of that hill. We again chose a section um, in the very corner um, of the visible bank and ditch, stuck our trench across that. Um, again, the ditch, no deeper than the turf. It's only about 10 centimeters deep. Uh, the bank, this time, has evidence for a palisade along the top. So we definitely do have a palisade fence at Durwood's Dyke. Um, the bank itself, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Again, the bank itself, um, no more than 50 um, or 60 centimeters high. Um, so, not particularly substantial. But the interesting thing is the way that they're using the topography of these monuments. These banks, when you see them, look like they're an awful lot of work, but it's very clever where they've put them on the contours. Um, they're taking advantage um, of the topography. Just in passing, um, we left Durwoods until last because it was the highest and we thought the weather would be better later in the year and it snowed. Um, happy days. So, 
At the end of phase one of our project, we have our three sections um, across three parks, King Carden, Buzzet, and Durwood. Um, interesting differences, um, in at least two occasions, the ditches are not very deep, um, which is a bit of a surprise. Um, only one of the banks has evidence for a palisade along the top, um, which was at Durwood's Dyke, and at King Cardin, we have evidence um, for a stone core, and at Buzzards, we have our stone base. So, as usual in archaeology, having finished our three sites, we had more questions than answers. At King Cardin, is the park associated with the stone castle of King Cardin, which is the, the lower of the two red dots, or the potentially much earlier um, castle um, at Green Castle, which is now covered in trees these days, but it is a fantastic um, earthwork monument. Is it either of those two castles? Um, at Kin Cardin, just behind the restaurant where the car park is, there is this very um, distinctive um, quarry that's been dug out into the hills. Some of it is natural, but we were beginning to wonder, could that also have been utilized as a killing zone for the park? Could they have been driving down animals from the park into this area um, where they were eventually being killed? At Buzzard, um, we have no idea of the name of this park. I've mentioned that to you already, but is it associated with either of the two castles in the vicinity? Glass Clume or Drum Locky? There's a clue in the Exchequer Rolls where there is a rental for broad arrows for drum locky. Broad arrows relating probably to arrows for hunting. So does that suggest that Buzzet is related to that castle? Or could it be Royal associated with the Forest of Clooney, which is right next door and is a much bigger um, area of um, where deer hunting took place? The other thing about Buzzet, on Google Earth, um, I spotted this very distinctive um, rectangular building just outside the park to the north. Um, and I wondered, if we ever go back, it would be quite nice to have a look at that building. Could, could that be a hunting lodge? I mean, if it's associated with the park at all. Um, more of that later. And again at Buzzards, we have these two other um, upstanding buildings um, inside the park. Um, Durwood's Dyke, um, this is quite an interesting site. I mean, who did it belong to? I mean, the location, the, the linkage with Alan Durwood, to put it mildly, is extremely vague and dubious. Um, it's all based on Warden's book on Forfarshire and Angus. Um, and I have no idea where he got it from in the first place anyway. Um, the bank and ditch line running down the hill, um, which is where we stuck our section through further up, um, comes to a dead halt. Um, and I'm not convinced that it ever went any further. So I'm beginning to wonder whether this park was ever actually properly finished. Um, it, it does need more work, to be honest. It, it's uh, an intriguing place. Um, and the temptation um, when we were having lunch at Peel Farm, just down the hill where the, where the hunting lodge probably was, to dig a hole in the floor while nobody was looking, um, <laughs> we managed to prevent ourselves from doing that. So, last summer, um, I had an email from Kevin, who was now in um, Wyoming University doing a PhD, um, saying, hey, I'd like to come back and do some more field work uh, on some deer parks in Scotland. Uh, and he started to go on and on about digging some of the ones in the borders, um, some of these other ones. He said, there's loads of them in Scotland. I said, OK, look, steady on. Um, we've looked at three. Um, we have some questions um, that we'd like to answer. Let's choose two of the three, go back, and do some more work on them. So we chose Kincardin and Buzzet. And I said, also, at Kincardin, let's see if we can get permission to go and dig a trench inside Kincardin Castle and see if we can get any dating evidence or, more to the point, some finds, because we had no finds so far whatsoever, um, or maybe even some formal evidence, because Kevin was desperate for some deer bone. Um, so he quite liked that idea. Um, so we started by going back 
um, to King Cardin. And this time, um, we decided to open a trench um, across the bank and ditch line here. Um, these days, it's covered in forestry, um, but, it, but it is still quite visible. Um, so we laid out um, a very narrow trench, 10 meters long in the forestry, um, opened um, our trench. Quite a lot of damage from tree root and animal disturbance, but pretty much straight away on top of that bank, we have a stone-packed post hole. So it looks like there's a palisade line on this side of the park as well. Um, again, the bank is about 60 centimeters high, but again, it's built on the contour line. Um, so it, it actually is taking advantage um, of the topography um, in quite a clever way. Um, and there's our section um, through the bank with um, our post hole there. So you certainly do seem to have a palisade line coming along the front. Um, we looked at a couple of other earthwork features that we spotted in the park as well, but we didn't really get any clear idea of what date they were or, or how they related to the park, if at all. But I have to show you this one. On Google Earth again, which is becoming quite a popular tool in our field, I think, um, where the bike line carries on below, beyond the forestry, there is this very distinctive um, enclosure at one end bank and ditch. Um, that's a view of it there. It's very difficult to photograph. Um, I looked at that on the ground and I thought, well, this is very odd because this looks like this ought to be a pond. Um, but it's in the most unlikely location for a pond. I mean, it's not even inside the park. Um, so I was a bit dubious of that interpretation. One other suggestion that's been made to me is that it might be um, foundations for grandstand looking down over our potential kill zone, but we need to do more. Um, King Carden Castle. Um, that's um, King Carden Park. Is it? Sorry, King Carden Park is. Sorry. <laughs> Kincardine Castle is down at number one. King Card uh, Green Castle is at number two, and the Deer Park is at number three. So, having got Children Monument consent, we went into Kincardine Castle, um, specifically looking. Stop. Ah, that's it, right. I think we're all right. Yes, um, having got Shadow one in the consent to, to open a trench in Concarbon Castle, we decided we would try and have a look at the area where the kitchen might have been. Now, before we have a look at the trench. It's worth pointing out to you that Kincardine Castle is rather curious anyway, because it used to have its own borough in the field next door, which is Kincardine. That's the county town of Kincardine. It used to stand in that field until it was finally deserted um, in the late 16th century. So there's a completely missing medieval town um, associated with this stone castle. Um, we picked um, a small area right by the main entrance into the castle um, and, and decided we would have a go at that and, and see what we came up with. Um, pretty much straight away um, in the area that Kevin was digging, we got this rather roughly laid um, stone floor, but rather nice um, faced stonework. Um, Unfortunately, the only finds that Kevin got from this particular trench included a rather nice, complete grill cream hair gel. Um, so we just did a little bit of later squatting uh, going on here. Um, this is the part of the room that I looked at. 
um, where we got the same floor surface sealed under a better meter um, of demolition material, stone, rubble, mortar. Um, and due to the depth and the lack of any decent area for the spoil heap, um, we ended up concentrating in those two sondages um, in that room. And um, the only find we have um, is a tiny piece of ceramic um, that's not a piece of pottery, um, but it's been suggested to me it might be from a ceramic mould. But we do have some deer bone, one piece of deer bone, um, and some pig bone. And we've been able to get carbon dates for those. The deer bone is giving us a carbon date of 10, 40 to 1220, um, which is surprisingly early, I have to say, um, because Richard Oliver tells me that King Carbon Castle was built in 1220, um, and that's coming from demolition material. He wasn't very happy with that, I have to say. Um, but the date from the pig bone is much better. I mean, that's 1530 to 1600, and that's from the demolition. Uh, that works um, a lot better for the, the, the desertion of the site. Finally, we went back to Buzzet. We had three targets. Um, we were going to open another section across the western boundary again, a new trench across the northern boundary, and a trench across that building. Um, the northern boundary at Buzzet is interesting because, I mean, there is a bank and ditch there, but the bank isn't very high, and if anything, they seem to be taking advantage of areas of marsh. You'll get the bank and ditch, which will then stop dead, because there's a very extensive area of marsh. Where the marsh stops, the bank and ditch starts again. So presumably they were using um, the marsh as a way of, of keeping um, the animals in the park. Um, we opened our trench across the northern boundary, and we have a passé line, or at least we have three post holes. The interesting thing about these is they're not in the top of the bank. They're in its internal side at that sort of angle. So it's almost like you have big timber stakes facing into the park, um, which I suppose if you were any deer worth its salt, um, you wouldn't want to be jumping over those. Um, again, this bank, um, as you can see from the section there, is no higher than about 40 centimetres, and it's basically built of upcast um, from the ditch. The western boundary, happily charging across the landscape uh, with this very big bank and ditch line. Um, I gave Kevin a mattock while I had a cup of tea, um, and we opened our trench um, across that bank. And again, the ditch shows up very well in the landscape, but when you actually dig it, it's no deeper than about 10 um, or 20 centimetres. Um, again, the bank stands at most about 50 centimetres high. But one thing we did spot um, cleaning up the very top of this bank after we did turfed it um, is something that looks like a, um, a fence line or a hedge line running right the way on the top of that bank. So maybe this side of the closet, there was a, a hedge line along the top. <coughs> now, the building. Um, this building is rather curious. I mean, it shows up very well on Google Earth. When you go and look at it on the ground um, now, it's very, very overgrown um, with heather and shrubs, um, and it can be quite difficult to make out. Um, we chose um, a point towards its eastern end and opened a trench right the way across uh, the width of the building. What we'd spotted is it's got a drain that runs right the way around the entire circumference of this long building. And when Kevin started to dig the drain on the southern side of the building, he finds a complete smashed medieval redware jug in the fill of the drain, which when I looked at it, I said, OK, uh, I'm not happy with that being any later than 14th century, um, looks like we might be dealing with a medieval building here. Um, I worked on the inside of the building and found a, a clay floor which had some rather nice charcoal samples on it, which have given us a carbon date of 1219 to 1295. We have a building that's 42 metres long. 
8 metres wide, stands at 750 feet above sea level, overlooking the deer park, and looks like it's 13th century in date. Now, interestingly enough, if that carbon date is right, um, that ties in with the reigns of Alexander II, Alexander III, kings of Scots. Um, Alexander III was a, a well-known hunter, um, with that fantastic painting with a very long name that I won't repeat. Um, at Buzzards, we have something that's been reinterpreted as a deer park, with this absolutely enormous building, which looks like it's medieval, overlooking the park. If that's associated with the park, could that be the hunting lodge? The other option is, we're not that far away from the Forest of Cluny, which I said to you earlier on, could it be associated with the Forest of Cluny in some way? That is still um, something of a mystery. The future. Kevin will be finishing his PhD this year, um, and it would be really nice at some stage in the future to do some more field work. If only because when we were back at King Cardin, they had just planned the interior of that park, probably for the first time ever, and all of the earthworks have gone. Um, that is a scheduled monument, but the only bit of it that was scheduled is the bank and ditch. The interior of the park is not protected, so there's nothing to prevent that happening. Um, Green Castle. If King Cardin's stone castle wasn't associated with the park, it could be Green Castle. It would be nice to go to Green Castle and find out for a start if it's actually medieval, because it could just as easily be um, an Iron Age fort. At Buzzards, um, there's a lot of marshland up there that I mentioned to you earlier on. It would be really nice to go back and do some proper environmental analysis so we can see what the landscape was like when this park was operating. Um, I think that would be quite an important thing to find out. What association, if any, does Buzzard have with the Mata Clooney, which stands less than a mile and a half away, and it's supposed to have been a big hunting castle with the Scottish kings? Is this their park? And unsurprisingly, um, I'd quite like to go back and have a look at some more of this building, please. Um, this aerial photograph um, is one taken by the Commission in 1987, uh, before there was intensive heather and bracken growth. Um, and that building shows up um, really mostly. It looks like it's got its own set of rich and thorough cultivation. <coughs> so supply and demand is going on here. Um, I think it's really interesting. So, in closing, it's been really nice to have a look at this largely unexplored monument type in Scotland. Um, more questions than answers, but they are quite interesting questions. Um, and the next stop on our agenda is the European Conference in Istanbul this year, um, where we have organised a session on medieval parks right away across Europe so that we can put this into context. Thank you very much. <coughs>